Greetings, I'm Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to this special Watson webinar, COVID Today, Is America Really Ready to Reopen? Our special guests for this broadcast are Professors Ashish Jha and Emily Oster. Ashish is the KT Lee Professor of Global Health at the Harvard University T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and he's also Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. On September 1st, I'm very delighted to say, Ashish will formally join the Brown University faculty as Dean of the Brown School of Public Health. In addition to being a practicing general internist, Ashish has, has great expertise on healthcare systems and health policy, and as many of you know, he's been writing, commenting, and consulting extensively on the COVID pandemic. Emily Oster is the Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence and Professor of Economics here at Brown University. She's a noted expert on health economics and statistical methods and has been writing extensively on the response to the COVID pandemic. Emily is also one of the co-authors of the extremely useful and informative website, COVID Explained. Emily's research focuses on, in part on why people fail to make what seem to be rational health choices, whether with respect to diet or lifestyle or contagious disease relevant to today's discussion. Let me just say a word about how uh, today's webinar will work. For about the first 20 minutes or so, uh, I'll ask Emily and Ashish some questions, but then we'd like to open it up to you all uh, in the audience to take your, your questions. For those of you joining us via Zoom, please write your questions in the Q&A window. And in fact, you could start doing that right now. You can just write your questions in and we'll get to them. And for those of you joining us via YouTube Live, you can also write in your questions. Do so in the comments section and those will, will get to me. Again, don't wait. Please start asking questions now. But Ashish and Emily, let's turn the conversation over to you. And again, thank you so much for being here today. So just to start off generally, where are we right now with the pandemic? I mean, we seem to be in a very different place from where we were in March and April. The pandemic seems much more widespread nationally with red zones and you know, case incidents um, appearing throughout much of the South and Southwest. We see resurgence in, in the Midwest and even a slow uptick of incidents in places that seem to have the pandemic really fully contained. So give us, maybe if you could both give us a sense of just where we are right now. Ashish, do you want to begin? Sure, I'm happy to. And thank you for having me in. Um... Uh, excited not just to be just not just about this webinar, but about joining the Brown faculty, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, let's talk about where we are uh, with the pandemic. Um, so, remember, this is a global pandemic, and the pandemic across much of the world uh, is raging in in places like Brazil, India, Russia, uh, large parts of the Middle East, uh, other parts of Latin America. Things are really quite bad in the United States. Uh, I would say we remain kind of the global hotspot. Um, and, and, and as a country, we're certainly generating more cases, more deaths than anybody else. Uh, though Brazil often, and many days often has as many deaths as we do. Um, but from a, within the United States, what I see is uh, much of the Sun Belt uh, was the hotspot. They are starting to level off. But you see a lot of states in the Midwest really picking up uh, in terms of number of cases in the middle of the country. And then the Northeast, as you said, Ed, is starting to creep up as well. Um, but the big picture point is that a pandemic that began in, with big focus areas in New York City, parts of the West Coast, uh, Detroit, has really become truly national. And, and a pandemic that initially began in kind of dense urban areas has made its way into suburban areas and has made its way into rural areas. And that has all sorts of interesting implications for the health systems in those places uh, and how we are gonna manage it. And maybe the last point as a, as a starting is that um, we continue to see real divergence in political leadership. You see lots of governors who continue to take the virus very seriously and are trying to do things to kind of keep it under control, and lots of governors who are doing really just the bare minimum and are uh, and not taking the virus seriously and not doing the things that we know can bring the, uh, the virus under control. And they're gonna have very disproportionate effects on those populations. And Emily, could you give us a sense of where you think we are? Yeah, so let me just sort of add, I mean, I think I agree, with, obviously, with everything that she said. Let me just sort of add add two things. So so first, you know, the title of this is like, is America ready to reopen? And I think that that kind of, th that framing is almost a bit uh, like, that isn't, I think, the right frame, because this is, this is although it is a global pandemic and is affecting all places in the U.S., 
at the moment, uh, those places are being affected really differently. And part of that's about leadership and part of it's just about the sort of the way things have, uh, have, have evolved. And so the answer to any, you know, are we ready to open X is going to be different in different, in different places. And I think that there's, that some of the conversation is missing that sort of that piece of the, of the nuance, the idea that like, we shouldn't, we're not gonna have the same answer to the, to the, the question in any, um, in any, in any location. I think the second thing I will say is, you know, in the in the early part of this pandemic, we kind of went into this place where it was like either we're totally open or we're totally locked down. And we and I think there were reasons to to totally lock down at the beginning. That seemed that seemed right. As we move forward, I do not think th there may be cases in which we we should move to a, to a fuller lockdown, but I'm not sure we're going to see as much of that. I think the political appetite to do it, even in places that. Are, are kind of well functioning is, is lower. And I think the economic appetite to do that is more is more limited. And so I think what we're gonna need to see the kind of leadership I'm hoping we'll see at least in places I live uh, is people sort of saying, okay, as things tick up, what are the steps that we need to take to keep that from continuing to, to happen? And what are the pieces that we need to lock down? And how can we kind of titrate that to keep things under control while recognizing that, you know, it is probably, there. We, we may that may keep us from needing to say okay nobody leave your leave your house and so I think that's we're entering that phase and I think it remains to be seen whether places can do that phase uh, effectively. I, I want to get to that the question you just raised Emily about what do we need to do but maybe just to back up I think some people maybe even myself have kind of a lurking suspicion that the the resurgence of cases the spread it's it is due to reopening and it kind of leaves again this lurking question of are, are we ready? Can we ever be ready? Or is it just, do we have to expect that as we reopen, we're going to see variants of red zone, orange zone, yellow zone? So let me start by saying, absolutely, the increase in cases is with, is with reopening. To me, like the moment you start having more activity, people get out, the number of cases will go up. Um, the question is, how much? What are the activities? Can you use other tools to stamp it out? Um, if you have, if you think about South Korea, which is often heralded and rightly so for having done a fabulous job, I mean they got they did so well that they had nightclubs open. Now we had nightclubs open in Phoenix, but that was irresponsible. Night there were nightclubs open in Seoul, and they at least could have made the case it was not irresponsible because their caseloads were so low. But then they had this terrible outbreak from a nightclub where one person who was infected uh, happened to unfortunately go to six nightclubs in one night and infected you know hundreds of people. Within four days, they had tested tens of thousands of people, identified every single person infected, identified everybody who was a contact of those people, identified everybody who was a contact of the contact, and essentially stamped it out. So the point is, did their reopening of nightclubs cause an outbreak? Absolutely. Um, but they could manage it. And my argument has been sort of twofold. The reason we needed a national lockdown in March is because we didn't have testing capacity. We had no idea where the outbreaks were happening. And second, we understood the mechanisms by which this disease spread so poorly that we also didn't really have a good grip on how to get it under control. Um, beyond not having a, a political appetite, which I don't particularly have any expertise on what we have a political appetite to do or not, I don't think it's necessary to have any more lockdowns because we can use far more nuanced strategy because we have much better data uh, and we can do things. It, there may be some places that get bad enough that you need to think about something as close to a lockdown. But in general, I don't think that's what is needed for the country. Emily, you've written extensively about, particularly for schools, what I think I could say best practice would look like, or at least what some of these mechanisms would look like. Can, can you describe them? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the one, um, so we sort of think about, uh, think about school reopenings, I guess, the sort of the two, like, response things that I would, that I would highlight are, you know, as she said, sort of the ability to test and, and contact trace, um, and sort of think about, okay, if there is a case in, the, when people talk about schools, there is sometimes this idea that, like, we should only open schools if nobody at the school will ever have COVID. That's not realistic, and that's not that's that's not a standard that we should hold. I think not a standard we should hold schools to. As we open schools, there will be people with with cases. The question will be how can we keep those cases from spreading? And a piece of that is going to be you know how do we respond to like how do we get the the sick person out of the the school immediately? But a piece of that is going to be how can we test and contact trace and kind of isolate in a thoughtful way so the the case does not spread. So it's not a nightclub. It's you know an isolated. 
small number of, of cases. To do that, we are going to need testing and contact tracing that is that is effective. And I think for me, we sort of ask like, what are the of the many many things that keep me they keep me up at night um, about schools. Uh, our total inability to get people test results in uh, in a small amount of time is among the the high points of the things that keep me up. And I think that's something we sort of said, like, what are we what do we need to invest? What kind of resources do we need to invest to make it possible to like not be South Korea because I don't think that's feasible, but to get closer in that in that direction? We do need to improve our testing infrastructure. We've needed to improve our testing infrastructure since March. Um, we improved it and then it was not improved enough and now it needs to improve more. And I know she should, she should look more to like, uh, like kind of sci-fi about this than I am and has, has, is much more optimistic about like having a very fancy testing. But I think, you know, at a minimum, we need to, we need to improve that for, for schools to be kind of, for us to be able to, to deal with schools effectively. Ashish, did you want to add anything about testing infrastructure? Um, only that I spend like 10 hours a day thinking about testing. And so I feel like uh, sometimes it's hard for me to have perspective on, on all of it because I'm so in the weeds. I will say this, which is I, um, testing, I have believed from the beginning is key to um, what, you know, essentially getting much of our lives and our economy back. Um, we, we have failed to develop a testing infrastructure. I think when the president, whether jokingly or not in, in Oklahoma in Tulsa rally said, uh, I told my people slow down the slow the testing down, please. Um, I actually think that has been a signal out of the White House to keep, uh, really slow down how much testing we do as a nation, because uh, I think he actually honestly does believe that testing is leading to more cases. Um, but the bigger problem here is that the testing infrastructure we have is woefully inadequate for our nation. And while I have been pushing very very hard to ramp up our testing infrastructure. In the last couple of weeks, I have come to, to basically conclude uh, that we're not going to do it. We're not going to be able to figure out how to get more testing out of the infrastructure we have, and we need to shift gears. While we can continue doing PCR testing, uh, we need totally new modalities. And the good news is that those exist, and now we need to figure out how to ramp up those other modalities. And the mo other modalities have strengths and weaknesses, but I believe we can get to a point where um, we can have ubiquitous testing uh, but whether those show up in three months or they show up in 12 months is going to be driven in large part by policy. I mean, I think one thing, you know, one thing to sort of highlight on the on the testing, which I think that um, is a, I'm interested in Ashish's, is it, how, like what you think about this, is that I think part of what happened early on is we, we've been using these PCRs and we're thinking about testing as like a diagnostic tool um, and sort of like testing is like when you're sick, you get a test and therefore it's very important that the test be like really correct because you are feeling sick and we want to know if you have if you have this. And we and then we sort of started to move into people saying, well, actually it's important to do more asymptomatic testing, more screening to do this stuff. And we talk about that for schools, we talk about that for overall populations, colleges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we kept thinking, okay, the tests have to be these like good tests, that our screening needs to be just as good as, you know, our screening tests need to be just as good as this other thing. And I think that you know, Aaron Carroll had a piece that I thought was put it really well in the Times the other day, which was just saying, look, for, for screening, like we don't, you know, if, if there's like a 15%, 20% false, false negative rate, that's okay if you're testing everyone, you know, if you're testing everyone every day or you can use it for surveillance, it's okay if the if the false if the false negative rate is is actually reasonably high, way higher than we would accept in a diagnostic test. And I think we haven't made that shift. I think we're gonna have to if we want to actually like have a better sort of surveillance testing infrastructure. My question is what, what do we do though with the data that these tests are generating? In other words, um, yes, there are, I guess, many barriers to expanding testing, but once we get those results, do we have the capacity for contact tracing, even behaviorally, will people admit to, to, to whom they've interacted with? How, how does the, how do the next phases work after the, after we ramp up testing to, to make, the whole COVID response system work effectively. Do you want me to Emily, you did, or, or, no, I want to. I want to. Yeah. Ashish, now that's two questions. You can do the whole thing. Part of it's behavioral, though, for you, Emily. Yeah. But Ashish, go ahead, and we'll get to the behavior. I, right. So, a um, couple of things um, on the testing. Uh, yeah, Aaron Carroll's piece was very good. I had a, a piece, I think, the same day or around then about um, 
the need for what what I and probably I have to come up with a better marketing term, but the need for uh, cheap, fast, uh, yeah. mediocre tests. Um, like I think mediocre well, tests. That's not a good. That's not a good pitch. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> but, I, that's why I said I need a, a better. Uh, but here's the thing: they're actually the point is not. So here's here's a, a bit of a crazy statement. The point is not to identify everybody who's infected. The point is to identify everybody who's infectious. And, to, and we don't even have to get everybody, but we need to get a good large chunk of them. And there is a difference between being infected and being infectious. You can be infected, but not have a lot of virus and not be spreading much. There is a window in which infected people are really infectious. And these kind of mediocre tests actually do quite well if you get people in that window. They don't do so well if, you don't, if you're outside that window. And my take is I, I care less about somebody who's infected but not spreading. I care a lot about somebody who's infected and spreading. Right, so we want to we want to be able to do tests that come back quickly. There are tests now. We have the technology where you can get a result back in 30 minutes, and they'll usually get most people who are infectious, and they'll occasionally miss somebody. But if you get enough of them all the time, you'll actually drive the pandemic incredibly, like to a point where you may not even need to do contact tracing. Though I do believe contact tracing in general is a really useful ad ad adjuvant to this. Um, and contact tracing, and I, I will definitely let and, and want to hear from Emily about her views on, on the behavioral part of this. It has struck me that we've had a lot of kind of uh, simple thinking about contact tracing. Like first, for a little while, it was like, we'll use apps and apps will solve all of these problems. I'm like, no. And then, uh, and what we have Sheesh, learned- what, 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 Why not on the apps? What's wrong with them? Because there's a huge behavioral component. And like all of a sudden, if you start sending out pings to everybody, hey, you were near somebody within six feet of somebody who's positive. Like if I got that, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that outside of be a little annoyed and a little disturbed. So it's gotta be much more a nuance than that. Um, other countries have done a pretty good job on contact tracing. I believe we can, it is hard work. Uh, and we don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get everybody. Our entire strategy should not be contact tracing. It should be one of the tools we're using. And even if you get 50% of the contacts, even if you get 30% of the contacts, you'll actually make a big difference. Again, I'm, my goal is to get to 70, 80% of contacts. But the point is that even modest amounts of contacts can be a, a really useful part of a broader strategy uh, for getting the virus under control. We don't have, we keep looking for silver, silver bullets. And we keep figuring out that every one of these things is not a silver bullet, but we've got like three or four tools and you put them all together and the combination is the silver bullet. Emily, yeah. do you, want, you want to go ahead? Yeah, so I mean, I think that that last point is actually a really important one that somehow we have this idea that like, well, no, like no, indivi no individual thing is, uh, is sufficient or people, you know, what we tell people, we're gonna tell people to wear masks, but not everybody's gonna do it. Well, that's okay if most people wear them that's actually a lot better than nobody wearing them. So the fact that like not everyone will do this thing is not the same as as saying we shouldn't we you know we shouldn't do it. I mean, my view on contact tracing is that you know it is um, that in a it is going to be a useful piece of the pandemic control in certain circumstances where things are already pretty like dialed down a little, like not rampant. So in a place, you know, in like the sort of current situation in Texas and Florida, or like the situation from three weeks ago, I think contact tracing is pretty hard. It's kind of like everybody's contact, many people are in fact, you're not gonna get control over that. In places like New York or, you know, Rhode Island, like places with more limited or in individual schools, as we, as we sort of think about opening them, that's where I think we can do a better, we can use contact tracing more effectively because we have a smaller number of people we can isolate and we can actually like dial into figuring out who their real contacts are. Like the other piece is we have to actually try to limit how many contacts people have. So if you sort of think about the CDC definition of like, you know, people that you're within six feet of for more than 15 minutes without a mask or whatever, like that, I think that's what the CDC has said. We gotta kind of like make there be fewer of those people. So if everybody's wearing a mask all the time and trying to stay distant from people, then you don't have as many, uh, you know, we could sort of try to limit your contacts like people who live in your house and people you know you have close like uh, you know other people you're sleeping with outside your house and that could kind of be like your contact yes. Emily could you say a bit more about other behavioral aspects so whether it's mask wearing or hand washing or social distancing what's your sense of how people have reacted why there's been resistance and you know thinking forward how much resistance is there going to be moving forward to doing these basic things that are all going to be important for containing the pandemic 
I mean, I think that there's like, if you sort of take something, I, my sense is that mask wearing has, I mean, that's not my sense. It is true. The mask wearing has been the most controversial of these. You know, people don't want to say, oh, I don't want to wash my hands uh, because then they, they, like, nobody wants to say, it's like, why, well, why not? What's the matter with you? Um, and sort of similarly, social distancing, like people don't want to do it, but it also hasn't, like people don't, we don't talk that much about it. Mask wearing has become a thing. Um, and I think there's kind of like two pieces of that. There's one is that, you know, similar to, um, we told everybody to, you know, in the, in the sort of case of HIV where people are supposed to use condoms, actually it's kind of annoying to wear a mask um, and, you know, it's kind of uncomfortable. And so there's a piece of it, which is just like, like I wouldn't, I really want to do this. I would prefer not to be wearing a mask. So I think we're always going to have that piece. And then obviously there's this other piece where this just became like this weird political thing. And I think we know whose fault that is. Um, and it, uh, it's not yours. Um, and you know, th and then it became, then it sort of like, it was imbued with somehow when I wear a mask, it becomes, um, it is, it is a sort of political, a political statement. I think that's going to be simply very hard to, um, you know, simply very hard to, to un undo. Um, that's gonna be hard to undo. You know, I want to turn to, to the Q and A in a, in a moment, but let me just ask one last question. Um, say six months from now, presumably we won't yet have a, a, a vaccine or at least one not widely deployed, um, but hopefully we'll be in a place where the incidence of COVID is, is contained and, and, and stabilized. Just describe for me what that looks like in terms of the, our environment, in terms of behavior. So what, what ideally is our environment gonna look like to get to that more stable situation? Ashish, Emily, either one. You get just pick. Paint, 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 Ashish, go ahead. Paint a picture for me of, of what best practice is really going to look like for us. So I, um, I tend to be a, uh, an excessive optimist on where our what our future looks like. And uh, mm -hmm. so there are, um, I'll give you, I'll paint two pictures. Um, and, and then I'll tell you why I'm optimistic about the more positive one. The negative picture, which I think is where a large chunk of the public health community is, uh, says six months from now is February. And February is not going to be a good month for the United States. And that story says in February, we'll have all been indoors for large chunks of time. Um, the flu season usually peaks in January, February. Our hospitals get full in a good year. Um, and we will have large amounts of COVID, not just in the South, but across the Midwest, across the Northeast, and that we will have a lot of people getting sick and a lot of people dying and things will be pretty terrible. And we may see rolling lockdowns. We may see states shutting down for extended periods of time. Schools will definitely be closed. Uh, universities will be closed. Uh, and that it's going to be a pretty rough January, February, March, December, January, February, March, until a vaccine really starts becoming available and that people start being able to get outside. And that I think is in some ways a bit of a consensus view among public health people. And I think that's wrong. And I will at least try to, but it's important to understand that like really smart people think that is a consensus view and I'll, I'll give you my best. I think we're gonna have at least one therapy that will make a big difference in terms of mortality. And I think it's coming and it's, it's monoclonal or potentially polyclonal antibodies. And there are all sorts of questions about will we have enough doses and production and supply chain. I'm going to leave all those aside. Um, second is I do believe we are going to have ubiquitous testing available. We will be able to do testing for many, many millions of people a day. I think that'll make a big difference because if you know you're infected, uh, your behavior will change. Uh, you will not, hopefully, not as many people who know they're infected will go out to a, a bar. We may have bars and, and restaurants and many other things closed, but I am more optimistic that we'll be able to open schools in February than I am that we'll be able to open schools in September. And, um, and I just think because of the underlying changes in technology, we make the disease less lethal, uh, we make it easier to control, uh, and in large parts of the country, I think things will be better. And then there'll be a light at the end of the tunnel because we'll have probably two or three vaccines. None of them will be widely available yet but many of them will be heading towards that and that'll give people hope. That's my very optimistic view of February, but I don't know. Emily, what's your sense say for yeah, that's, February? I mean, that's interesting. I feel like this is a place where I don't have much of a, um, I don't have much of an, of an instinct. Um, I think I would kind of like, I kind of like the picture that Ashish is, is drawing, um, but, uh, but you know, I think I've certainly heard more of the, 
um, of, of the first one. And I think it's, it's I, I find it, I, I feel like this sort of where we are in terms of our understanding of the virus and our kind of progress on treatments is like very different than where we were four months ago. And I, therefore it is very difficult to think about where we will be four months from now, um, particularly because it's not my space. So uh, I don't know, I, I guess we'll see. Hopefully we'll be in a better place. Let's go to some, some questions from the audience. Um, Ford Shaper asks, uh, through, the COVID, through the COVID Explained website and Dr. Jha's blog, it's clear that both Dr. Jha and Dr. Oster strongly value good data, which seems to be lacking in regards to the coronavirus, particularly in regards to how the virus has affected people of color. I was wondering what methods you both have used to overcome these gaps and how the way we collect data could be improved to improve our understanding of the coronavirus and how it has affected different communities. And I think particularly people of, of color. Emily? I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that in general, our data collection has, has fallen down a lot. I think our, our evidence now on cases is somewhat better. And actually there are, you know, many places have pushed to try to, to say more about the demographics of those cases. I know Rhode Island has to try to, you know, sort of differentiate out the differential impacts on on uh, on communities of color from from the the rest of from to sort of separately separately isolate that uh, that information but the, you know this hasn't been a place where data has been has been widely uh, has been widely available or or collected and I think it's one of the you know many 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 failures of, of the kind of broad response to this the only thing I would add Ed, is how ad hoc our processes have been um, that some states are doing a fabulous job collecting data, other states are doing a terrible job. Uh, if you want to ask the question how many tests were performed in the United States yesterday, you have to go to COVID tracking. Uh, and COVID tracking is run by a bunch of journalists. And they are fabulous. They're great. But a group of journalists like pulling together, and by the way, that's what the Coronavirus Task Force of the White House uses. They use COVID tracking. So the White House doesn't have better data. They're using the same data that Emily and I and you have access to that's pulled together by a group of journalists run by a bunch of guys at the Atlantic magazine. Like this is nuts for a country of our size capacity uh, to out, out, outsource all of our data collection efforts. Um, what that has meant is that there have been progressive, um, thoughtful departments of health that have done a great job on trying to collect data on race and ethnicity and others who just have not. And CDC has gotten into the game and tried to collect data on, on some of this stuff late. Uh, CDC has been, its data collection efforts have generally been abysmal for about a month and a half. They were taking the weekends off on, on data updates because we're in the middle of a pandemic and why not take the weekends? We need, people need a weekend. Issue. People need weekends. But the CDC should not get the weekends. Like somebody <laughs> at the CDC should still work on Saturday. Um, so there's just been this like ridiculous level of incompetence on data. Uh, there was a National Academy of Medicine uh, event or like gathering last week. We were talking about kind of what do we need to be doing? And I was like, first, like we just have to start acting like a, a functioning um, nation that has basic data elements. And, and when we also have to get some amount of clarity on what are the data elements that we actually care about and want to measure. Uh, even this morning, the president in, in an interview with Axios was you know, bringing up all sorts of data stuff. Like, no, those aren't the things. Nobody cares about the metrics. So the key data elements and the key metrics, we've got to get some level of agreement. And then we can fight about how to improve and what the right policies are. But we have not been able to get on the same page on the same basic book of facts. We have a question from Penelope Skalnik, and she asks, I'm wondering about the safety of sending kids back to school, in my case, pre-K age. Given the many, many overwhelming factors to consider, are there a few key points that can help us make this decision, assuming we have the option to send our kids in person? Emily? Yeah, and so I've been thinking a lot about, about this decision from the, um, from, you know, and so there's, there's a bunch of pieces of this, but let's just sort of think about from the parent, um, from the kind of parent standpoint. Uh, I think the, the sort of big things I would have in mind are, you know, what does a community transmission look like in your, in your area? And so, you know, if, the, if there's a, a huge ongoing outbreak in, uh, in the area you live in, you probably should not send your kid back to school even if you, if, if you can, at least in the short run. Um, I think that there should be a lot of differentiation across ages and so sort of thinking about, you know, reminding ourselves at least that, that younger kids, elementary school age kids, younger uh, are, are less uh, they get less sick, 
they seem to transmit less uh, than, uh, than older kids. I think we should be focused on having those kids in the classroom first. It is also the case that those kids probably uh, benefit the most from face-to-face -face learning. And the other thing for, for families to think about is just, you know, what is your, like, what is your alternative plan? You know, how and how good or bad is that, uh, is that plan? And so I think sometimes people have been um, structuring this decision just saying, like, should I send them back to school? And I've really been trying to encourage people to say, or what? Like, what is your alter like, what is your other choice? Is it that you stay home? Is it that, you know, your, your spouse stays home? Is it that there's a grandparent that, that sort of somehow thinking about, thinking about what the alternative is may help make this decision because I think otherwise people are kind of like, it, it is, it is challenging to, to sort of work through the details without knowing what you're trading off with. Great. Let's um, turn to a question from Georgia Gallant. Uh, what do you think about pool testing? Do you see it being implemented? Ashish or, and Emily, what, what's your sense of, of pool testing? I like it. I'm a fan. I'd vote for it. Yeah. Um, no, it's, look, uh, it's good. It's an effective tool. People worry a little bit about loss of sensitivity that uh, once you pool, you, but I think, and I, Emily made this point and, and I have as well, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm both a physician and a public health person, so I'm going to beat up on one part of my identity over the other. I think we've been thinking too much like physicians and not enough like public health people. And physicians care deeply about, and Emily made this point, about getting the diagnosis right. Public health people care deeply about getting it right for the population. And we, we, we have to do both, but this pool testing, yeah, you lose a little sensitivity. But the idea is if there's a really infectious person in that cohort, it'll still show up. And so I think we have not deployed this effectively enough. Uh, it's an incredibly effective way of expanding our capacity, especially if the underlying incidence is low. And so I'm a fan. We should do more of it. Emily? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I agree. I think that it is, it is part of like a, a sort of large set of things I think we should do more of, which are on their own maybe not like the, the piece, but uh, you know, like wastewater testing, I'm like a little more skeptical about, but I think in this space of kind of like, I know you're, you like, you like, you find wastewater, just the poop. Um, and, you know, but I think there's just like a lot of these things we could be doing, particularly if they are uh, you know, relatively cost effective. We have a question from Dick Barker. He asks, much is being bet on effective vaccines. There is a significant percentage of the country that's adamantly anti-vax. Do you expect that to limit success? Emily, do you want to talk about some of the behavioral aspects of? Yeah, so, I mean, so I've worked on I've worked on anti on the sort of anti vax piece of of childhood uh, vaccinations. So a lot of people don't like uh, don't like vaccines. They don't like new vaccines. They're they think that they're anxious. That this this and the other thing. And you know if, you know if the first vaccine is the Moderna, um, if that's the thing that we get first. You know, that is a kind of vaccine we've never actually used before. I'm not sure how that maybe end up being kind of opaque to people, but you know, it's gonna, there's gonna be, oh, we've never tried this before, we don't know, like it might turn you into Spider-Man. Like, so, I mean, we're definitely gonna get some pieces, um, some, some pieces of that. But I think sort of, there are two things that a vaccine will buy us. One, some people will get the vaccine and that will be good. And so, you know, we will, like many people will be eager to get this vaccine. I think in part, some of the resistance to existing vaccines is that nobody knows anybody who has the measles. So people think, why would I get my kid the measles vaccine? Nobody I know has the measles. That piece of it is like people that people people are thinking about COVID. They know that it is a risk. It's a thing that people get. So I think that will that will help us. Um, and I think the other thing is once we have a vaccine and you could get it, then it will be much more difficult for people to there will there will be a pressure to to reopen um, and to and to do things even if. Uh, even for like, so things like teachers, right? So many teachers are resistant to go back, going back to school. Some of that is well-placed. Some of that is probably over uh, overstated. Once there is a vaccine, if you say, I'm not going to get the vaccine, but I also don't want to go back, that is going to be treated very, very differently. And I think that that will mean there will be more pressure for, for kind of opening and that will sort of drive pressure for vaccinations. Great. Ashish? I completely agree with all of that. And, and um, you know, when I've looked at the data, it, about half people say they get it, about 30% say they're not sure, and 20% say, uh, no way in heck am I getting a vaccine. Um, and, and the way I look at it is that 30% uh, 
is probably quite persuadable and uh, we don't have to get everybody to get a vaccine. Um, and at the end of the day, like I'm gonna decide based on the data, right? So if, if you ask me, are you gonna get the vaccine? The answer is I'm really pro vaccine and I will get it if I'm convinced that the data is there. Um, and that means that the FDA has done its job and that we have enough data on safety and efficacy. And um, and so I, I think a majority will get it. I also think the disease dynamics will totally change even once you vaccinated another 20 or 30% of the population, uh, the spread of the virus will dramatically lo get lower. And what I worry about is there will be communities where the rates of both infection and immunization from vaccines will be very, very low. And then they will become places where the, vac the virus spreads uh, much more effectively. Because it's one thing to think about national immunization and, and immunity rates, but of course, America is a country with lots of mini communities and you can imagine there'll be communities where uh, there will be much more challenges. And so I worry about that. But as a nation, I think we'll be in a very different spot a year from now. In recent days, the media has reported um, maybe pressures from the White House to accelerate the development of vaccines. And you know, the implication was that maybe safety standards are being reduced. How do you both feel about that, uh, both with respect to the accuracy of those reports, but also how is the public going to absorb that kind of information, you know, that, that questions the safety of the vaccines because of the rapidity with which they're being developed? Let me, maybe, really let me, yeah, let me start here by saying I am not super worried about it. And I'll tell you why I'm not super worried about it. Um, so first of all, like the, the, the number of people who have sort of said, October surprise, October surprise, we'll have a vaccine. It will get shortcut. FDA will feel pressure. Um, there's a lot being done to inoculate the FDA against pressure. And I think, think of it this way. If like a week before the election, the FDA shortcuts a lot of data and says we have a vaccine, like are Americans all of a sudden who are planning on not voting for the president gonna switch? Like, I just, I don't know. And again, they're political scientists who understand this much better than I do, but I'm, uh, October surprise works if there's a surprise, but I, I don't see this as a surprise. Second is that the pressure to get it right is going to be so intense uh, that I just, I don't really see the ability to have a vaccine with enough safety data. We might have efficacy data, but we, I don't know that we'll have safety data um, by then. And if we do, and if it's done well, and we've got 30,000, 40,000 volunteers and, and three, four months in, no one's showing much in the way of severe uh, complications, like I think we'll all evaluate that and, and make a decision. But I am largely not worried. I don't see corners being cut. Uh, I see things being sped up in a way that are mostly reasonable, but there's a cost to not speeding up, right? There's a cost to taking five years to build a vaccine. So I think this is one of the few instances where the federal government has really gotten this right. Uh, I think it's been largely led by Tony Fauci, which is part of the reasons they've gotten it right. And a little plug, we're doing a little event with Tony Fauci on Friday. Um, uh, so please join us for that. That's a and webinar with Brown President Christina Paxson. Exactly, exactly. So that'll be fun, Friday, one o'clock, I think. And, um, but the point is that I'm, I'm pretty confident on the vaccine. I'm pretty bullish on the vaccine. And I expect that most people will get a vaccine sometime early in 2021. Early when? Early 2021. <laughs> and on this also, I am, a, I am beyond consensus. Consensus among public health people is it's much later in 2021 or maybe 2022. And I think people are just being way too pessimistic. Yeah. I think we're gonna have, I don't think we're gonna have one vaccine. I think we're gonna have four vaccines by sometime in, in early to mid 2021. And I don't think an American vaccine will be there first. By the way, there are no American vaccines. These are all international collaborations. But the first vaccine will come out of China. Uh, and then we'll have some from both Europe and the United States uh, by the end of the year. If there's time, we can come back to that. I, I have a number of questions. But a number of people, uh, Barbara Oberketter, Lee Kossin, have asked a question about case numbers. So I'll just read Lee Kossin's question. Where there is little testing, how are case numbers determined? Emily, I mean, you're both statistical experts. Do you want to comment on that, Emily? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of tracking of, of cases and prevalence is um, is really like problematic uh, and complicated. Um, you know, in part because uh, because if you sort of think about like what would you really like, you would like a kind of like the a random sample of the population to be tested every day. And and ideally with something cheap, and then you would sort of have some sense of like the prevalence. But this case. The idea that the number of cases is somehow like a relevant piece of information, 
is, I mean, of course, it is a piece of the information, but what you care about the, is the prevalence in which you could get from different kinds of, you know, random or uni universal testing, none of which we, we have. And so the result is that, you know, the case numbers are moving around with the amount of testing. All right, so if you test more people, you get more, I mean, they're moving around with the prevalence and with the, and with the amount of testing. And so, um, so what that means is if you, uh, if you want to uh, have a lot of cases, then you can do a lot of testing. And if you, much more problematically, if your goal is to have few cases, you could just not do that much testing. And then you would get lower, right? Am I wrong? Is Ashish, is that not? No, I have a slightly different take, but please finish your thought. I don't no, mean no, to. No, no, no. Tell, tell me what you think about it. We can have a dialogue. Yeah, yeah, no, so it's, um, I think cases, the number of cases uh, matters a lot, but it's got to be interpreted in the context of, of the number of tests and the percent positive, right? Yeah. And so, so this is one of the reasons why people have often said, well, are we in so much better shape because we have so many more cases than we did in April when New York was in really bad shape and yet our death numbers are so much better. Our, you know, New York's percent positive on tests was around 40, 50%, which is uh, awful. It basically meant that New York was probably missing 95% of cases when it was just because of the testing capacity limits. So I track every day, I, every evening, I look at for every state in the country, number of cases, which I think really does matter, but has to be interpreted in the context of the number of tests and the percent positive. And when the percent positive rises, my brain does a mental calculation of the number of cases is way being underestimated and I have to do some sort of a correction and there's no good formula for correction. So it is a bit of a complicated issue, but number of cases as you know, prima facie matters. And, um, and the best example of this is New York is doing an extraordinary number of tests and they have fewer cases than Oklahoma um, because their underlying prevalence is low. So I don't, I'm not disagreeing with anything. No, no, I mean, I guess, what, I guess what I would say is I think that those two, these sort of these two pieces, there's the percent positive and there's the number of cases and they are, in, they are individually largely not that informative. Together, they are quite together. informative, but you need to sort of put them together because you can, oh, like in some sense, I, I feel I could manipulate either of them very easily. If you told me I need you to target like a 1% prep, like, you know, test positivity rate, I just go out and test a bunch of people I know don't have it. Exactly. Right? Similarly, if you told me I need you to target, you know, fewer than, you know, 50 cases a day, I guess I could just test 49 people and I would be guaranteed. Um, so in some sense, like those two pieces, that we, those ha they have to go together. Exactly, completely. Um, and I think that's, the, that's kind of the, the key. Yeah. Great, we can come back to some of the data. In fact, there's a, an additional question about data. Harry Chalfin asks, since the USA's daily new cases are higher now than they were in the spring, why are the daily new deaths still not as high? I think there's, Two, I think there's two reasons for that. One is that uh, that we haven't seen the deaths ca catch up. I think the deaths are probably still catching up to the cases just to some extent. So for a long time, the deaths were very low. And so they're clearly like pretty lagged. I think there's another piece, which is, there's two, I guess is, uh, the other piece is that the case fatality rate of the people we're testing is lower. And I think that's partly that we're doing more tests for people whose fatality rate is low, um, like you know people in their 20s. And partly that we probably that we have there has been some improvement in fatality rates even for older people. Some of the treatments have uh, we've gotten better by better treatment. So I think for for those, am I missing some? Any nope, those are the three. Them? Those are the three. Great, Ashish. Did you want to add anything? Emily got them all. <laughs> all right, super. Really thanks. Them, but what? Why bother? Super. Um, Robert Purcell asked a question, uh, quite a sp specific one, to reopening of campuses across the country. What testing turnaround period is regarded as, as needed for the reopening of, of campuses generally? Professor Oster, you want to take that or do you want me to? Um, why don't you start with that? All right. So um, there is no, there's no like set standard, right? That says you have to do it by X. Um, my take is if it's more than 48 hours, certainly if it's more than 72 hours, it's totally useless. Um, under 48 hours should absolutely be a goal. And, and my very strong preferences that we should be at 24 hours. Um, and, and it's just an issue of like, how much are you willing to miss? And the longer you wait, you're just gonna miss more ability for people to transmit. So somewhere in the 24 to 48 hours, I can live with. Uh, and what I would really like is 15 minutes, thank you very much. And I think that's possible, not with the current tests that are available, but again, the kind of tests that I think will be available by November, uh, we can get there. 
Um, and uh, so 24 hours is really my goal and hope, but 48 hours is probably okay. We can live with that. Beyond that, it, it starts becoming less and less useful. Yeah, I agree with that. Emily, do you sense that's true for public schools, you know, even thinking beyond campuses? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the sort of public school districts that I've seen talking about testing, and these are mostly pretty richer places, um, talking about talking about testing, um, have sort of talked about trying to use rapid testing more. Um, you know, I think most, so a lot of campuses have talked about versions of surveillance testing and sort of, or uniform, like doing a lot of testing. I think most schools are not talking about that kind of testing. So they're really talking about, you know, what, what are they doing when there's a, a sick kid? How do they test that kid? How do they test the other kids in the class? And there, I think that there's been some effort to just sort of push towards things that would come back really quickly because, you know, if you wait 10 days and you tell everybody you have to be home until you get, um, you know, until we get the results of this kid's test, then it's like, it, it takes 10 days to get it. That's not really, that, it's not good. It's not feasible. You know, Emily, you mentioned your, your answer is in reference to wealthier school districts. What about poorer school districts? Are you seeing any um, examples of creative solutions there for, for testing and general infrastructure for resumption or even globally? Is there an answer that um, is more equitable than just the rich neighborhoods are gonna do better? I mean, look, this has laid bare the fact that our school districts are unbelievably unequal, a fact which we already knew. And now we know even more in an even more extreme way than we than we knew before. There are wealthy school districts that are talking about, oh, every kid's going to get a Chromebook, and you know, a, and a, like a personal Sophia antigen machine, so they can, you know, I mean, like there's, and then there's, and then there are, you know, poor school districts where it's like, well, we don't have any school nurses in our schools. Like we get a school nurse comes for 45 minutes every three weeks, and you know. And, and they have, it's like, well, we, our teachers have to buy their own colored pencils. So I don't, I don't really know how we're going to like install a new ventilation system to make it safe to open. So, you know, I think these problems have already been there. They have been there for, for decades and they are, they are sort of in your face in a way that they were not before without resources, without more resources. There are many places where it simply will not be safe to open. Will they open in a way that is unsafe? Maybe some of them. Uh, is it fair to ask kids and teachers to go back to that? Absolutely not. Can, yeah, can Ashish, go ahead, please. Um, so about, uh, so we've been working with a bipartisan group of both Republican senators and Democratic House members uh, to try to initially get a lot of money for schools in the previous stimulus bill. Um, but we think we're gonna be able to get a chunk of money in the current stimulus bill Again, I wish we had passed it four weeks ago. I don't. I really don't have any influence on the congressional calendar. But, um, but in it is the idea of having testing money for every school district in America, and it's a it's a large chunk of money. Whether it's even a good idea, whether schools will be able to implement it, whether they'll be able to get somebody to do it, is a different question. But I have been obviously a big advocate of getting testing in schools and trying to figure out how. To, there's no way. 80% of school districts in America could possibly afford to do testing. Uh, I'm not sure that this bill will solve it. Uh, I'm not even sure that the final will, will, bill will include it, um, but we have been trying to get resources for both improving things like ventilation, but also testing for schools. It's just, I wish we had been able to get this passed a month ago uh, when it would have made a much more of a difference than getting it passed in mid-August. Great, thank you. Uh, let's turn to a question from Arameti, who is watching on YouTube live, and Arameti asks, I'm quite concerned about the politics and commercial competition working against the public health best practices of implementing a vaccination campaign in the US and globally. Could you comment on that? And, and I understand the question to be, once a vaccine is available, how is a global production system going to intersect with geopolitical competition or commercial competition? How is that likely gonna play out? Ashish, Emily, either one. Ashish, I, you thought more about this than I have. So this is um, a really important topic and there are two elements of this that I wanna take on. One is how do we get equitable distribution in the United States? And then the second is how do we get equitable distribution around the globe? And there's been a lot of work being done on equitable distribution around the globe. Um, there are uh, companies, so one of the major producers of vaccines for the world is India. And there are a couple of major Indian pharmaceutical companies that are um, already starting, have started ramping up production of the 
Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, for instance. Um, so my, my hope and expectation is that we're going to see a lot of production outside of the OECD countries uh, where that will allow for distribution. It will, I am not super worried uh, about getting vaccines to people in China. I am not super worried about getting people the vaccines to people in India and South Asia. But once you get into Latin America and, and once you get into Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it, it's just much, much harder because India has often been the producer of these things and China has been, but they're going to focus on their own countries first, right? There's going to be very strong pressure in India to make sure everybody in India has access to vaccines before those vaccines end up uh, uh, elsewhere. So we do have real problems there. WHO has been a major and very helpful coordinating organization on trying to create a global supply for vaccines and making sure everybody gets it. Um, in the United States, there are very specific issues, and a lot of us have been pushing the White House uh, to share with us plans for distribution and making sure that there are no financial barriers for individuals, uh, that it is uh, given at the point of care for free to people, and that it is distributed widely, and that there is a particular plan for making sure that underserved communities uh, have access uh, and uh, are not left behind. And we have not seen the level of detailed planning from the White House that I was uh, hoping for, and I'm going to ask Dr. Fauci about this on Friday uh, to see how he has thought about it. Emily, did you want to add anything? anything to add to that? That seems good to me. Okay, great. Um, there's a question from Erica Sevitson, and she asks, what will it take for people to be able to take part in the performing arts again? I'm especially thinking about live music, chorus, bands, et cetera, which means, a, which means lots of potential for spread of respiratory droplets widespread vaccination. I mean, I think, unfortunately, like, you know, there are, um, you know, there are things that we hopefully can do sooner than that. But like, live singing, singing in groups, th this is like, this is not going to happen until we have a vaccine. And uh, Emily, there's a question, a number of people have asked a question relating opening a pub, reopening of public schools and the practices needed for that to practices needed for safe voting. What's your thought about the relationship between opening of schools and voting? Is there a relationship? Can we, can, are lessons transferable? I mean, I think that, you know, they, they share the feature that I think both are important for civic, you know, for civic functioning. Uh, I think the, the, the sort of two important differences are that, you know, actually uh, it is possible to vote by mail. Um, whereas, and, and voting by mail, um, although not as good as voting in person, is probably uh, substantially closer than like trying to teach a five-year-old to read uh, uh, by mail or Zoom. Um, so I think that sort of the alternatives that we have for voting are much are in some ways much better. Um, and I, I, it is also I think like easier to imagine how people could safely vote in in person. You know, although um, again, you know, I think the the I think it is easier to imagine the logistics of safely voting in in person in some ways than the logistics of of school. So, you know, I see, I see the parallel because they're both these sort of civic activities, but I think the practical details are pretty different. Great. We're, we're reaching the end of our hour. So maybe time for one or two more questions. There's a question from Meg Garen Calvert. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing any names, who's from the Center for Healthcare Economics and Policy. What roles do you see for multi-sector collaboratives in local communities to expand capacity and overcome some of the challenges you've discussed uh, involving better testing, tracing, masks to improve, uh, to improve response? If there are successes there, how can that experience be shared nationally? So are there some local multi-sector best practices that maybe we can draw some lessons from? Emily? I, I don't know, Ashish, I totally understand. Or even globally, are, are there, have there been any local actions at the subnational level or state level, county, town that really look promising? I guess um, to the extent that I, I think I get the underlying principle behind the question, it, it, struck, it has struck me that in this pandemic, um, one of the things that I think we've learned is that, you know, sort of straight up public health advice from scientists doesn't magically lead to broad scale behavioral change among everybody in the in the world. Uh, shockingly, another way of saying shockingly, not everybody listens to everything I have to say. Um, what has been really clear is that places that have done better have really engaged local civic leaders uh, to amplify and validate that. And so like any kind of movement that requires large scale behavioral change by people, 
Um, it has always, in my mind, has worked best when it's been multi-sectoral and not just come from scientists or public health people or from economists or, or any one group. And, and that certainly feels like uh, a, a model that we have to think about for vaccines. It's a model we have to think about uh, when we try to you know, tackle uh, problems with people getting tested. Uh, so, so that's kind of a generic answer. I don't know if I have more specific than that. Great. And maybe we'll end with this question. This is a question from Kristen Sills. And it's to, to you, Emily. Kristen asks, can Dr. Oster talk about the socioeconomic impacts of keeping kids home from school? Women especially are bearing the burden and dropping out of the workforce to care for and homeschool kids. Can our economy withstand this kind of economic strain on top of everything else? Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of two big pieces of that. So, so one is just, you know, what are the impacts on, on low-income kids, kids, you know, kids, students of color, what is happening to uh, to learning, and I think we know from the spring that there were huge drops in uh, in learning outcomes for uh, for actually for all kids, uh, but especially for for students in uh, who were in schools. So we saw those much more significantly in schools where there was a larger share of the students were uh, were were in lower income populations. So I think that there's a sort of pretty clear inequality that has been created by the absence of of in person uh, of in person schooling. As we think about going to the to the fall, that will sort of continue to be true. We've already seen very extreme forms of this kind of inequality in places where schools have gone totally virtual, like in California, where then we have the micro school, the like, you know, I saw something on Twitter today where somebody was advertising like, you know, like the like we need the best possible teacher for a pot of seven kids. If you find us a teacher, we'll give you a two thousand dollar Uber Eats card. That's not for the teacher, that's for the person who finds them the teacher. Right, so like we're now in a space where like rich people are getting all kinds of, you know, rich people are having their own fancy micro schools and poor people are like not experiencing that. I think this inequality is just, it's just, just really, um, it's just really extreme. And then on top of that, you know, in, in families in which, you know, you have somebody who's gonna have to stay home with the kids, that is more likely to be a woman and we're gonna see, you know, women dropping out of the labor force, women taking a break from the labor force. We know that those breaks, have long-term career consequences. Um, you know, I mean, I, I sort of, I see this in the women that I, that I talk to and the women that I work with that, you know, we're home all day with our, with our kids. And the fact is that like mom is usually the default, uh, is, is usually the default parent. And so it doesn't, you know, I like, you're, you're, uh, you're trying to do your job, you're trying to do your Zoom and your kids are coming in to be like, oh, I need help with this, I need help with this, I need help with this. And you know, eventually people are like, forget it, I can't do both of these things. And so I think we're gonna see that, we're gonna see those consequences for a very long time. Thank you. Well, we've reached the end of the hour, but let me thank the audience for um, tuning in and for providing such great questions. Let me especially thank both Emily Oster and Ashish Jha. Ashish, we're so happy you're joining us here at Brown and the faculty. Uh, I'm so honored to be colleagues with both uh, you, Emily, and you, Ashish, and thank you both for all the work you're doing to address the pandemic on behalf of all of us.